Okay, so our last segment in the subduction zone theme focuses on the various forms of subduction zone seismicity. And this diagram from the title slide shows the global distribution of earthquakes since 1903. And as I noted in an earlier lecture, subduction zones host the vast majority of earthquakes, including the largest ones and the deepest ones. And they relatedly represent the greatest source of seismic hazard because unlike the earthquakes that are also very common in mid-ocean ridge type settings, uh, transform faults, subduction zones are very commonly adjacent to land masses. So they have high potential for ground accelerations that can affect uh, buildings and property. Overall, subduction zones have hosted several tens of magnitude eight and above earthquakes just in the past century. And so one of the first things that I want to get across is uh, the concept of why they're so large and make sure that it's clear you understand uh, what allows them to get so big. So I made this little uh, animated sketch. Sorry, it's uh, a little bit hideous, but hopefully it's helpful. And it illustrates the very basic concept that thrust fault earthquakes are so large because the seismogenic crust is much thicker in that regime, both because thrust faults are shallow and because thrust faulting regimes are relatively cold. So this first part is showing um, a normal faulting regime. I'm just gonna draw a sketch, a sort of crustal column. There's the surface, there's 15 kilometers, and in a normal faulting regime, you might expect a 20 degrees C per kilometer or even hotter geothermal gradient. If we define the brittle ductile transition as at 300 degrees C, then we're gonna have a brittle ductile transition at 15 kilometers. Above that transition, we'll have seismogenic crust. Below that, we'll have aseismic. Then normal faults dip about 60 degrees. Now, if we look at that in plan view and kind of arbitrarily choose a length for that normal fault and fill in the fault plane, we see there's this sort of limited area over which the fault plane can actually slip um, in a seismogenic way. Now, this ex example is gonna switch things around to look at a thrust faulting regime, uh, again, a crustal column, but in this case, we're gonna have to go deeper because the temperatures are much colder. So to get to 300 degrees, you have a 10 degrees C per kilometer geotherm. So we're down at 30 kilometers to reach the brittle ductile transition. Furthermore, or sorry, so again, above 30 kilometers, we'll have seismogenic crust, below it, we'll have aseismic. Furthermore, thrust faults tend to be much shallower. I drew a 45 degree plane there, but it's actually 30 degrees is a typical um, dip for uh, thrust faults. And so to actually reach down to the brittle ductal transition uh, at 30 degree dipping structure, you're gonna need an area of a, fault, of a fault plane that is substantially larger than in uh, the opposite normal faulting regime. So I hope that just kind of intuitively gives you a sense that thrust fault planes are much, have much greater areas within uh, the seismogenic crust. And that is why uh, earthquakes in reverse sense or collisional boundaries can be much larger. Just as a little more quantitative uh, information on that, the seismic moment is partly dependent on the fault area. It's the shear modulus times the fault area times the amount of displacement and then the moment magnitude, which can be converted to, um, yeah, and then the seismic moment can be converted to moment magnitude, um, which is what we use to classify earthquakes. And so you can see that, again, if the thrust fault plane has a much larger area for the same displacement and the same shear modulus, you'll end up with a much larger seismic moment and ultimately a much larger moment magnitude. So now let's talk a little bit about the different types of seismicity. We discussed last week how we can distinguish at least four types of seismicity in subduction zones. Here I'm illustrating them using the Honshu subduction zone in Japan. So one type is the upper plate four arc and arc seismicity, which I won't talk about much um, in this lecture. Another is of course the plate interface earthquakes, also referred to as shallow focus megathrust earthquakes, uh, we'll talk about that quite a bit in this lecture. Note that this region of shallow focus earthquakes has both an up dip limit and a down dip limit to earthquake recurrence. So up dip, it does not uh, generate earthquakes very near the trench and down dip at a certain point, 
and also stops generating earthquakes. There's also the seismicity that decorates the Benioff zone or zones uh, can be two Benioff zones within the slab itself. These do not occupy the interface, but they're in uh, sort of at the moho of the oceanic plate and also within the mantle lithosphere. These are the ones that could be very deep. And then there's the more recently recognized phenomenon of slow slip and tremor, which occurs both up dip and down dip of the megathrust seismogenic zone, but not within the megathrust seismogenic zone itself. We'll talk a little bit about those today as well. So let's look first at the megathrust seismogenic zone. One of the first questions that we might ask is what controls the down dip length of the seismogenic zone along the megathrust? And Relatedly, what controls the total size of the section of the megathrust that actually slips in an earthquake? In, gen in other words, what generally controls the earthquake magnitude? When it comes to the down dip length of the seismogenic zone, it turns out that our old friend phi, the thermal parameter, which is the convergence rate times the subduction plate age, comes up again and correlates rather well with the down dip length. So this is a plot showing an approximately linear relationship between phi on the x-axis and the length of the seismogenic zone on the y-axis for several uh, active subduction zones. And from a physical or process-oriented point of view, we can hypothesize why this might be. And we can come up with some pretty plausible explanations as to why both the up dip and down dip limits of the megathrust seismogenic zone should be sensitive to temperature and therefore the thermal parameter phi. So in the case of the up dip limit, people have suggested this is probably related to either uh, the lack of consolidation of downgoing sediments as in the diagram on the left with the argument being that the sediments are too porous, they're too fluid rich and they're too squishy to, a, to store elastic strain, so earthquakes can, can't be generated or can't pass through that uh, very shallow depth range. Alternatively, the diagram on the right is suggesting that perhaps the up dip uh, seismic a seismic transition is actually related to the stability field of particularly weak clay minerals, such as smectite I mentioned uh, in the last lecture develops in altered basalts, and this diagram is showing that where smectite is preserved, perhaps the interface is too weak to host earthquakes, uh, but once you react out the smectite component, perhaps the megathrust can store elastic strain at deeper levels and therefore host megathrust earthquakes. Similarly, the down dip limit seems to also be controlled roughly by thermal parameter or temperature. And this limit likely coincides with the depth where rocks transition from deforming via frictional mechanisms to viscous mechanisms, typically between 300 to 400 degrees. So this is the sort of classic brittle ductile transition in subduction zones, just like we think uh, occurs um, and defines the seismogenic thickness in continental lithosphere uh, beneath other types of uh, faults, strike sub faults, for example. So then I mentioned we'd also want to know what controls the fault area that actually slips on the plate interface. Not all earthquakes rupture the whole subduction megathrust, thankfully, because that would be a whole lot of giant earthquakes all the time. But instead, the megathrust hosts both large but also small and moderate sized earthquakes. And there are many discussions over what fundamentally controls this. And one of the main concepts that in, that's invoked to explain this is this concept of asperities, which we can define as an area on a fault plane that has increased frictional resistance. It's, it's something stubborn or stuck that sort of requires the buildup of stress to actually yield. It's a strong heterogeneity, in other words. And unlike this movie, in this case, modeled after a strike slip geometry, but if you just picture it turned on its side, it's pretty much the same as a thrust, uh, thrust fault geometry. And it's going to show the progressive failure of asperities, which in this experiment are represented by dry spaghetti noodles in a vise that is being turned at a constant strain rate. So let's have a look. It's, it's also uh, narrated. <laughs> 
This is a model of a strike slip flying. Two pieces of wood, they're sliced all the way through here, and there's grooves going in this direction, perpendicular to the fault zone. This We're going to tighten in this direction here, which will cause motion like this, which is right lateral strike slip motion. And the fault zones don't have uniform friction. Usually there are spots that are stuck patches, which are called asperities. And each noodle in this model represents an asperity. So as I turn the uh, tighten the vise, you can see the fault is starting to move, but now the noodles which are acting as asperities are preventing that motion. I'm going to move very slowly and we'll see what happens in terms of the sequence of noodle breakages. Slowly I'm turning crank and now I'm not seeing much motion. Oh, there we go. One earthquake went. One small earthquake. Another one, another. I'm turning at a uniform speed. I can feel the stress is building up. So what we had was a sequence of, oh, there goes another one, a sequence of events where there were a few at the beginning, and then there were quite a few in the middle that might have represented a little bit larger earthquake or multiple asperities, one breaks after the other. And then right at the end we had another pop or two, which would be aftershocks, or equivalent to aftershocks. Okay, sorry about the bit of uh, echoing there. I guess that's what happens when you embed a YouTube video into a YouTube video. But in seriousness, hopefully that illustrates the general concept of asperities in a qualitative uh, food science sort of way. Moving to a slightly more realistic depiction of asperities, still a cartoon, here's a diagram illustrating what they might look like on the subduction interface and how they might behave in terms of strain buildup and release over time. So the idea is that the non-asperities, the regions between the asperities, uh, move fairly slowly and continuously, and they slowly load the strong patches until they fail in uh, fast earthquakes represented by the blue lines here. Each earthquake in the stuck patches uh, then causes a sort of post-seismic relaxation effect in uh, the weak non-asperity regions around them. So now let's give some thought to what some of these asperities might actually be. So one probably intuitive example is subducting seamounts or other forms of topography that reside on the downgoing plate. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on this, especially in terms of numerical modeling, as in the example, example on the left from some of Jonas Rue's work. And analog sandbox style modeling is on the example on the right. And these models show that seamounts can indeed generate large stress concentrations on the interface around them as the subducting slab drags them down. And they produce all sorts of interesting stress and strain shadows in front of them and uh, in their wakes. The topographic patterns that they create in models are actually not unlike those observed in bathymetric data from active subduction zones, like this beautiful example from the Costa Rica subduction zone, these three sort of subducting seamounts blasting through the trench here. <clears throat> Asperities don't necessarily have to be topographic features, though. They could be induced by lithological variations in what's subducting. This diagram summarizes the frictional properties of different materials that might occupy the subduction interface in the shallow megathrust zone. Serpentinites are in blue, and common silicates, quartz and olivine, are in orange and red. And what this illustrates is just how different the frictional properties uh, can be, both the rates of frictional healing shown on the y-axis and what's termed the slip weakening distance on the x-axis, which is a measure of how much slip needs to accumulate before the material reaches its weakest frictional state. The details of that are not so important, but it, this just illustrates how variable frictional properties can be. So you can picture then that asperities can be set up by different amounts of oceanic crust 
uh, different amounts of sediments, different little slivers of exhumed serpentinized mantle that gets subduction to, subducted to depth. Those variations can lead to uh, asperities that influence earthquake patterns. Just one additional example emphasizing, in this case, the role of fluids and fluid pressures. Maybe all of the subducted rock types are essentially the same, but some are hosting trapped fluids, so are weaker than their dry counterparts. And so the dry regions may define the effective asperities, whereas the wetter regions are the surrounding weak uh, non-asperity sections. So those are just a few examples of possible asperities on the interface that might affect the size of earthquake ruptures on the megathrust. Um, but there are many other possibilities discussed in the literature and a complete understanding of this still very much eludes us, which makes it quite challenging to quantify seismic hazard and do any impactful seismic forecasting for subduction settings. Speaking of things we don't understand, the last topic I want to touch on is slow slip and tremor, which is also an interface uh, phenomenon. But as I mentioned, it occurs uh, both up dip of the megathrust earthquake zone near the trench and down dip of uh, the megathrust zone beneath the forearc. And slow slip and tremor is composed of two main components. There's the slow slip, which is detected at the surface using GPS detectors. It usually involves displacements of a couple millimeters per day, but it can last for several months or even years. And in total, slow slip events can actually add up to large magnitude earthquakes, in some cases reaching magnitudes of above uh, magnitude six, maybe even up to magnitude eight, but they occur very slowly. Then the other component to slow slip and tremor, of course, is, is the tremor component. And these are seismically detected events, but they're small earthquakes that have low frequency. They're a bit like micro seismicity, except they're actually slower than micro earthquakes in terms of uh, their rupture velocity. And commonly, these two components occur together in what are called episodic tremor and slow slip events. I like this example of a single event from 2007 in Cascadia. This represents an event that occurred on the deep subduction interface below the megathrust lock zone. The colored dots are showing tremor events and they're color coded by time. And the colors just illustrate how the tremor migrated a long strike of the plate interface. It was accompanied by slow slip over about a 15 day period from January 14th to January 30th. And when you look at events like this in cross section, they appear to concentrate right near the mantle wedge corner in Cascadia, and they also correlate with a seismic low velocity layer uh, that's interpreted to reflect lots of fluids uh, for metamorphic reactions and, and very high fluid pressures. When we look at these types of events over much longer timescales, they show very episodic and oddly predictable patterns, and in some cases, slip reversals. And some cases, these recurrence patterns actually correlate with Earth's, Earth's tidal cycles. This is a longer time series uh, for Cascadia, now showing um, the displacement aggregated over several years. Displacement's on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis. The right-hand y-axis also shows a histogram of tremor activity. And what this is showing is these you have these constant slow displacement events that are punctuated about every year or so by reversals in the slip direction and associated spikes in tremor activity. They recur amazingly regularly, and the correlation between the slip reversals and the tremor events is, is very stark. So these events have proven very complicated and, and perplexing, and unfortunately their relationship to regular earthquakes and their role in potentially affecting the recurrence patterns are basically loading uh, the megathrust and, and sort of their involvement in preparatory processes for megathrust earthquakes is still very poorly understood, but a very vigorous avenue of um, active research. Ultimately, I'll just 
indicate they suggest some change in the size and distribution of asperities on the subduction interface as it reaches the brittle ductal transition. In other words, perhaps the mega thrust is defined by big fault asperities, uh, like shown in red patches on the diagram on the left. These yield regular seismicity, whereas maybe slow slip and tremor events may reflect weaker contrasts between asperities and surrounding rocks, and also perhaps smaller, more distributed disparities in, the, in a more viscous matrix. We don't really have an answer for this, um, but it's quite interesting uh, to consider the possible explanations for these wide ranges in the seismic style. So I'll leave you with uh, this summary of everything we covered in the subduction zone segments. Um, some Subduction zones are the downwelling branches of Earth's mantle convection. They contribute primarily to net growth, but secondarily to the destruction of continents. Their velocities are driven by slab pull, but then governed by energy dissipation into the mantle, uh, the interface shear zone, and slab bending. They have thermal gradients that are very sensitive to convergence rate and plate age, the thermal parameter phi. They exhibit dehydration reactions that correspond to thermal profiles and are responsible primarily for arc magmagenesis, but a wide range of other processes. And they're the source of most great uh, earthquakes on Earth due to the large fault surface area and asperity sizes. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you on Friday.